So really the very first thing that I want to do is I want you to get a good understanding of how we can translate assembly code from a binary back to source code. The reason why I want you to understand this is because it's gonna be the most reliable way of understanding what a program is doing. When you take a look at different tools, they're going to give you some really good insight into the program itself. But if you really want to know exactly what's executing, the assembly is always going to be the best source for that. And it's very helpful just to generally understand what kind of assembly instructions you're typically going to see, because if you you know happen to see them in a disassembler type program, you can immediately understand, oh, that's you know code to do something in particular, right? You understand exactly what that code is doing. So one of the easiest ways to start to get this insight is to take programs that you have written, compile them, and then take a look at the binary and see if you can sort of map back all of the code. So let's take a look at a really simple example of this. I have a main function. And this main function just returns one, right? Now, of course, we have to understand exactly what that's doing. When you return one, what you're doing is you're setting the exit status or exit code of the application to be one, right? So that's just something to keep in mind there. This is setting the exit code. So that's all this application is really doing. Let's go over to our compiler and let's compile our code. We now have this nice little binary and I can of course run this binary and, you know, if I take a look at the exit code, which I could do with echo dollar sign question mark, I get the value of one, which is the exit code that was set by the application. So you can see that our binary is compiled, it runs, and it does what we expect. Now let's try to get the assembly code from it. So as I showed you, if you try to open this in Notepad, it just turns out being like garbage, right? We can't really read it. So there are special programs that can actually translate that code back into assembly code. One of the simplest ones is known as OBJ dump. I'm going to show you a lot of different disassemblers as we go through reverse engineering and all of them have different strengths and weaknesses. OBJ dump is really just like a basic way of getting assembly code. It's like very bare bones, very simple. So we're going to go ahead and run this. And what we're going to get is a ton of assembly code. So, you know, we got what we were looking for, which is the assembly code. However, we're faced with a slight problem. And it's one that, you know, a lot of people see when they first start reverse engineering and they start to get a bit confused. It's, you know, there's like 50, 60 lines of code here and there's only three lines of code here. So what is going on? Well, what's happening is there's a lot of code that's needed to really just get your program running. So a lot of this is just like setup code. So this is all just like setting up things to get the program actually up and running. We don't actually really care about this because we just want to see the part of the code that is referring to the logic that we wrote in our program. We don't really need to know anything about what's going on here, at least right now. So we're going to sort of ignore this for the time being. And, you know, at some point we may revisit a lot of these types of ideas. But for now, we can really just ignore everything except for this part here. This part here is important because it's labeled as main, which is the same name as this function, right? So you can see that those two match each other. So this must be our main function. Now our main function has a much more reasonable like six or so lines of code, right? So that, that's much easier for us to look at. And when you really understand assembly programming, you'll see that it's very easy to break down exactly what this code is doing. So these first two lines of code here, the push RBP and the move RSP RBP, these two lines of code are going to appear in pretty much every function that is inside of your program. What this is doing is it's basically working to preserve the stack for the actual function to execute. You're always going to see this code when you have a function. So this code can effectively just kind of be ignored, right? It's just sort of like a base boilerplate that's always going to be present for these functions. And you don't really need to worry too much about this actual code itself. We will see, you know, instances where it's used and we'll explain those types of ideas. But for now, we can just sort of say, okay, that code sets up the function for execution. And similarly, these last two lines of code sets up the function to actually return back to where it started. So it gets us back to the thing that called this function. So we can effectively just kind of like ignore those two lines as well right now. So we don't need to worry about those two lines. We don't need to worry about these two lines. That leaves us with one line of code to look at, nice and simple. And that line of code is moving one into EAX. Now, when I look at this, it's, it's pretty easy for me to say, okay, this is probably setting that return, right? That's probably that exit code. And what we need to do is we need to say, okay, well, let's, let's just prove it to ourselves. Let's say, okay, if I change this to four, if that truly is that line of code, that one should change to a four, right? Since it corresponds directly with it. We'll recompile, 
we'll do the dump again. And do you see how that changed to four? That tells me that this is actually the exit code, that return, right? And furthermore, if you understand x86 assembly, you'll know that EAX is the register that's used to represent the actual exit code of the application. So it makes perfect sense that this actually is the exit status code, which is the return. So that tells us that this actually is setting up that return value. So from here, we now have a pretty good understanding of exactly what this uh, exactly what this code is doing, right? It's setting four into EAX, which is the actual return. This part here sets up the function. This part here returns us back from the function. So with that, you now have a very basic idea of how to reverse engineer a really simple program. So we're got up and running and we understand the very, very basics of reverse engineering. We're going to keep doing this and we're going to keep building up our understanding and seeing more and more of the assembly code. And then we can really dive into the actual reverse engineering processes once we have a better understanding of all of the different code that we're typically going to see when we do compiling together. So thanks so much for watching this video. In the next video, what we're going to do is talk about different ways of calling functions like printf function, for instance. We're going to get a look at how that works and we're going to get a look at how the compiler actually optimizes code because we'll see that when we start to call external functions. So thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.